Okay, everyone, thank you for attending. Uh, I think this will be a very lively dis uh, discussion we're going to have, and we really do want your participation. Uh, it's going to be very, very informal. I'm Lou Tucker, VP and CTO, Cloud Computing at Cisco. And if you saw the demo yesterday and you saw a mark up there on stage, you were probably wondering, so where's OpenStack? So the purpose of this sec session here is to show you exactly where OpenStack is and how it plays into this. So Mark? Thanks, Lou. Hi, everybody. Mark Neal with Comcast. Uh, you know, that's exactly what we want, actually. We don't want our customers to know whether things are running on top of OpenStack or anything else, because our customers shouldn't care too much, right? We want it to just work. So uh, fortunately, we've got a bunch of experts here today to tell you how it is working, and a little bit uh, under the covers, at least what we're allowed to share. We're probably not as tight-lipped as the NSA, but uh, you know we do have some approval processes that we have to go through to get things uh, released. But we would like it to be interactive. We welcome your questions, and you know we'll answer any that we can. Um, so let me hand it over to Warren. We also have Andrew and Bill here. Um, Bill's one of our big users, and he's actually one of the primary users for the service that you saw yesterday, our X1 platform. So. Uh, Warren, why don't you take it away, and we're going to have a seat. And feel free to interrupt us with questions. We really do want it to be interactive and hit whatever you guys are interested in. Okay. All right, so uh, we'll tell you a little bit about our uh, experience with OpenStack. So um, <clears throat> we really had to uh, end up uh, selling the cloud uh, internally. And uh, we started off uh, a little bit over a year ago um, looking at uh, building an internal um, OpenStack cloud. Um, at that point, it was, it was pretty amazing to think that um, we went from essentially nothing to uh, yesterday demoing a, a real live product uh, being powered by OpenStack. Um, <clears throat> so we took uh, the attitude of build it and they will come. We had uh, fairly limited offerings of essentially um, Nova and uh, Swift. Um, and then uh, we did uh, end up going on uh, essentially road shows, going around to all of our um, different engineering and development teams. And to give you a little bit more um, background on that, um, as you could probably imagine, Comcast is an extremely large company. Um, not all of our uh, products and uh, applications come from um, the same groups. So you have um, kind of siloed development teams. <clears throat> so we had to really introduce uh, OpenStack to them and sell them on this idea. And uh, what's even funnier is that uh, before that, I had to sell myself on the idea. And because uh, I, I can't sell. I'm a horrible salesman, <laughs> so if I don't believe That's a strength, in it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if I, I if I wasn't going to believe in it, there's no way that I could sell it to someone else. <clears throat> so we wanted to we wanted people to start thinking, what if, right? So what if you could reduce your time to market? Um, at Comcast, we have uh, um, pretty long processes to try and uh, procure equipment, get it out there. Um, and then get your connectivity set up, right? So we want people to concentrate on the applications, not necessarily on the hardware, which unfortunately uh, means that as the cloud administrators, we have to take that on. We don't necessarily get uh, some of those advantages. Um, so we also wanted people to have fewer network connectivity issues. Um, one of the ways that we sold that was that we're going to put this in um, part of our network that's uh, a little more open than other parts of the network, and ideally, um, you would have connectivity to it without too many problems. And uh, even better than that, if you just put everything on OpenStack, uh, then you really won't have any connectivity issues. And we also wanted to um, give people distributed compute and storage uh, and make that easily available. Um, the, the key difference here between um, what we were building and offering is that it's, uh, it was largely a, a self-service model. <clears throat> so we do have other um, offerings within the company but um, it's not truly self-service. And uh, I enjoy, uh, when someone comes to me and asks me for VMs, I tell them, no, I'm not gonna give you VMs, but I'm gonna give you um, the ability to create your own. And so I think um, the best way to sort of uh, demonstrate this is really just, you have to show it off. It wasn't until I um, got access uh, to OpenStack itself and started spinning up uh, VMs of my own um, and then it really, really, um, uh, it clicked in my mind. And so here's the, the scary thing, right? We're going to run a live demo. Yesterday. 
It worked last night. So um, let me describe what's going on. Actually, uh, let me make this a little bit smaller. Whoa, we're a lot smaller. So I think this will suffice. So we developed, um, one of my teammates, uh, Prashant Hari, uh, developed a uh, Python script, um, which essentially um, would spin up uh, instances, um, uh, assign them floating IPs if you wanted, and uh, add them um, to HA proxy if you wanted as well. Uh, this was prior to um, uh, the load balancer as a service uh, coming about in Grizzly, um, and uh, so we, we decided to undertake this on our own. Uh, however, uh, in the future, we will end up um, going with uh, Grizzly and, and using the load balancer as a service. So what we're doing here is we're spinning up uh, 20 instances um, on OpenStack. Um, they're going to get automatically added to uh, an HA proxy, and we'll come back to this in a couple minutes. All right, that was weird. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, we had to, you know, like I said, we went on um, road shows and we were uh, talking about uh, OpenStack to the uh, different uh, architecture and uh, engineering teams and development teams. So what we were looking for at first is really our uh, best friends, right? So these are, the, these are the people that really understand how to design applications which scale horizontally and are fault tolerant. Right? And they, they understood the concepts of um, ephemeral storage and how to use object storage because it, initially we weren't offering uh, block storage. Um, they understand how to use orchestration and automation to, to get their uh, instances rolled out. And they, just in general, um, were designed to work in a cloud environment. There's another tier of uh, applications that um, we wanted to uh, really bring into the fold but um, we may or may not have been uh, necessarily uh, ready to uh, do it right then and there. Uh, so some of these are like uh, databases and other applications which require um, persistent block storage. Um, there are some applications that require extremely heavy resources and it may, may not make sense necessarily to incur the overhead of virtualization. So um, mass is uh, something that we've been very interested in. And then finally, um, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily uh, to us ideal to do image-based deployments. We really wanted to push people to do the um, automa automation and orchestration using things like uh, Puppet and Chef. And then there's the third tier of folks, and they're a little bit scary for our environment. Right? So these are things like um, monolithic databases. Uh, applications which have um, single points of failure and uh, OSs which uh, don't necessarily work uh, all that well under KVM or um, uh, play well with uh, Vert.io. And then finally, um, at Comcast, we have um, quite a few applications which uh, their deployment model is a one, you know, like something like a 100-page doc and someone's sitting behind a keyboard. Um, if they lost uh, VMs, uh, we'd probably have to run for cover. So there we go. Um, we have uh, 20 uh, nodes that have been deployed and added to HA proxy. I apologize. Our, uh, our internal uh, site for this is a little bit slow. But these are uh, real live graph graphs. So of course the, uh, the demo part worked, but then uh, I can't prove to you that it worked because the graphs aren't working right. Okay, here we go. So, <laughs> All right, so um, what, what we're looking at here is um, the sessions that are connected to uh, this uh, sort of test environment here. here. And um, you can see that we're, there's a very consistent load because um, there's a team uh, in the X1 side that's generating some uh, load test. And you can see the, um, All right, this, is, uh, this looks uh, quite a bit different on my screen than up there. You can see that over the course of a week, we've gone up and down. Uh, and 
this is actually quite amusing to me. Um, we were told that uh, we basically maxed out their load test before uh, being able to max out our servers. And then you, here are the servers that I ended up spinning up just a few minutes ago. Um, we went from uh, here to here, and that's a difference of 20. Uh, there are no inactive servers, so all of them worked. Um, and normally, you would be able to see the, uh, the servers over the course of a week. Unfortunately, that graph's a, a little bit slow here. So there, there it is. Um, there are all the servers that we've been spinning up and down over the course of this week. And you can see, uh, last night here, I really wanted to make sure that it would work, so I scaled it up to um, 100 and then back down, and uh, everything worked fine. All right, so I'm going to let uh, my manager, Andrew Mitri, uh, take over here and describe a little bit more about what we're doing. Thanks, Warren. Uh, great demo. Um, yeah. So I, I thought we'd share a little bit on what our vision is around OpenStack at Comcast. Um, uh, we're really hoping to build a unified environment um, where we can operate most of our critical and innovative initiatives. So something that as we start to build newer products, um, they can access the environment and scale out quickly to be able to serve our large customer base. Um, we want to provide that technical agility, efficiency, and velocity to our business and reinforce and capitalize on scaled design principles. So kind of the question that I've been getting for the past couple of days is, what kind, what kind of deployments do you guys actually have out there today? And, and while we can't say specifically, I'll give you what date details we can. We started out in our national data centers. Um, we have a few thousand cores, uh, tens of terabyte of RAM, and hundreds of terabytes of replicated storage. Uh, primarily object right now, and we're, we're rolling out some block. Um, uh, we have development, lab, and production environments stood up today. Um, but what we're doing a little bit different than maybe some of the deployments out there is we're really looking to go towards distributed data centers. Um, we have a desire to scale to hundreds of cells, as OpenStack calls it now, as we move deeper in the network and closer to the customer. Um, we want to distribute our compute, storage, and network fa fabric to support that elastic scale so that the application can leverage saying, hey, I need to be in these 100 different cells to be close to the customer, or I need to be in this region because there's a load here and, and, and manage that elasticity. Um, and some of the ways we're addressing that with our applications is we're really targeting greenfield applications, clean slate, free of legacy requirements. Um, and we're looking to OpenStack um, as the virtual agent and scheduling layer to stitch this all together. Um, why do we choose OpenStack? Um, we feel that our problems aren't the hardest problems on the planet, and so we want to be part of that community solving all these types of problems together. We can learn a great deal from engaging in a broader, tech, broader technical community, and we have a little bit to share, too, from the size and scale of what we do. Um, we feel that the community releases new features quickly. Um, we've been running on Essex now for about seven, eight months, six months, six months, I guess. And, um, too long. At this point. Yeah, too long, and it's running well and stable for us, uh, knock on wood. And um, it, receptive to broad and deep participation, even from the heavyweights. Um, and we want to avoid the vendor lock in. That's really important for us. Um, and what we're kind of looking for as we're moving forward is, is that abstraction, composability, and orchestration as key. Um, we want to make the underlying hardware more fungible, so like we can swap out any piece and it's not going to affect our end user. Um, we're looking for intelligent resource scheduling, um, understood by the app but managed by OpenStack. So the app can say, hey, I need this type of resource in this type of place or in this type of environment, um, and OpenStack can handle delivering that. Um, we want to have an effective separation of concerns, uh, you know, the data replication and the data layer. So like if we want to be able to land data in certain places and replicate here or not replicate and whatnot. And we want to encourage among our developers improved software design uh, principles, you know, maybe things like Chaos Monkey or whatnot, right? So, um, uh, and then we want to separate the application development from the underlying infrastructure services. So today we've been focusing mainly on infrastructure as a service, but we want to go both above and below. So we have a lot of interest in metal as a service, as well as uh, platform as a service. Um, we're seeking harmony among our apps, cloud infrastructure, and network. So we want to balance that cost, reliability, scalability, and security. And we want to simplify and better utilize the network storage and compute. 
the app knows best, right? So we're, we're trusting the app to, to manage that, you know. Um, and we want to move security and connectivity policy deeper into the application groups and control. So I think that's it, and maybe we can go into a... Yeah, Andrew, can I ask you a question? Yes. I know it was probably no more than about six weeks ago, maybe eight at most, and we're having a conversation, well, what could we actually show at the summit here today? And I heard things about, well, speed test, you know, we could do that. I'm going, well, you know, for this audience, I'm not quite sure. And I heard Mark then pipe up, well, we can just show, you know, Xfinity X1. Wouldn't that be impressive? I want to know how nervous you were when you heard Mark say that <laughs> and, and congratulate you in actually delivering it. So, so actually, I want to give major props to Bill in helping us out with this. So um, at, six weeks ago, we were not running X1 in production. We had, Bill had started testing some stuff, exploratory phase. Um, but uh, they stepped up and we, we worked together as teams in cross-functional across our organization and, uh, and actually made it happen so that we could show this in production. Bill, I don't know if you had any feedback when you got that call from me. Is this, okay, this is live. Um, yeah, so uh, the team that I work on, uh, which is primarily X1, uh, we have a lot of people that have to deal with standing up our own infrastructure and, and networking gear. And one of the things that we would like to do is obviously move faster. And so when I, I first heard that you know we were, were being asked to do this, I, I certainly was nervous at first. And then I, I'd read up a little bit about OpenStack, but never tried it. So uh, I started talking with the gang here and got access. And I saw that they were like, here, we'll give you a quota. And here are some base images. Good luck, kind of a thing. I mean, and, and willing to help, but, but and uh, it took me about an hour. And then I was like, you know, able to using the APIs like stand up and tear down nodes and it was awesome. There was like no no like big process in the way, no pile of paperwork, no JIRA tickets. It was we you have a quota to work from, like and you know, here you go. And and the experience from my side has been awesome. Um, so there are you know some things that I'm looking forward to in OpenStack, such as like load balancers of service and 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 DNS um, integration and things like that, but as far as my first interactions with it as a as an OpenStack user, not as a cloud administrator, have been fantastic. Question? Question? Yeah, and other than the, the hardware you just you learned about, what did you learn about the other vendors going to a similar uh, So, unfortunately, that's one of the things that we don't talk about. Um, we don't talk about vendors specifically. We do use some of the uh, technology from Cisco. Uh, that's one that we've gotten cleared. Um, you just leave it. You can just No, we want this to be ubiquitous. We want this to be um, vendor agnostic. So we did we did get some professional services from one of the professional services group uh, that, that's running around here at the conference, um, just to help us get familiar faster and sort of give us more leg on the ground. Um, but we will, you know, one of our design principles is we do not want to do something that locks us in with a particular partner. And we want to stay on the the core stock open stack. Yeah, we want to be on the trunk. More questions. Oh, sorry. You can kill the audio. We got to kill the audio. It messed me up yesterday too. <laughs> yeah. My non-answer. Yeah. I don't think so. No. 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 I think we want to we want to develop expertise in this area. So we will work with folks and we will pay folks when necessary and collaborate with folks and maybe not pay them when necessary so that we can learn and mutually benefit and, and move together. You know, I think there are, the point to that, to that sort of second category is there are things that we can learn from someone and they can learn from us, uh, including other users of OpenStack. This isn't always a vendor that we're talking about, right? So we're interested in collaborating with folks. You heard the Bloomberg folks in the uh, uh, presentation yesterday talk about 200 locations around the country and when I, as I was in the back uh, following our discussion 
um, you know, I was asking them, how are you guys thinking about that? What are you going to do? And I think there's, a, you know, that's where the community is now. We're at the point where real world users are starting to solve their actual problems. And coming into the conference, I would have been, I was going to be surprised to learn that someone uh, wanted to take OpenStack and run lots of smaller installations, but there it is, Bloomberg wants to do it. And, you know, I, we exchange business cards and I want to develop that community around uh, users that have similar problems to solve. If I could also add, I know that when I um, informed my management chain that we were doing this with Comcast, the response I got back was, Lou, you do know like Comcast is one of our largest customers or whatever. Don't blank it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> and my response was, no, we're actually doing this develop together. It's much more like co-development because we do have the OpenStack community. We, we have people here now who are experienced and trained in OpenStack and providing input and making the changes there. So that's a... That, I think, is a part of this new model about how vendors want to work with their customers because we can come together and provide simultaneously provide that kind of vendor-neutral, vendor-independence that a customer is always wanting, but now being able to get the kind of support through us and through others that are, that are vendors in the OpenStack community as well. Just one more reality check, and then I'll take that question in the back. Um, you know, we have 55 million devices in people's homes that are tied to video delivery. So that's no small, you know, legacy system that we have to move over. Um, and, you know, I can't even remember if I said it in the talk yesterday. I'm pretty sure I did. But I kept it anonymous. You know, those, those, the software development platform, the systems engineering, e you know, ecosystem around those 55 million devices is the old style stuff that is difficult for us to manage. And we need to bring as much of that to the future as possible, just for the health of our business, while also building a new platform that we call X1 that we're rolling out like gangbusters and we're rolling out to more markets, um, you know, throughout this year. So we, you know, we're in, we're a mature business. We're not a brand new business that's trying to figure out, uh, you know, we're going to put out our first product and we've got this totally greenfield, wonderful world that I sometimes look at longingly. Um, we've got to figure out how to bring our business along. And so partnering with a company like Cisco, which happens to be one of the core suppliers of that legacy infrastructure, has advantages to us. You know, we, we like that close working relationship because if we're going to be able to pull that, those 55 million devices forward, it's going to be with partners like Cisco and others. In the back. So, repeat the question so it's on the video. Yep. So, uh, the question is uh, were there um, third party uh, softwares that we use to, uh, I think, uh, essentially make life easier? Um, so, uh, one of the, some of the key ones that we absolutely depend on are like Cobbler and Puppet, right? So, we use that to actually deploy um, OpenStack. Um, we didn't. <laughs> We decided very early on that we didn't want to be in the business of trying to um, install OpenStack manually. Um, I'm sure many of you here have uh, tried that on your own. It can be uh, quite cumbersome. Um, Especially in SS. Oh. Um, so we were, for, for monitoring, we actually ended up uh, just staying our, our typical route, and we stuck with uh, Nagios and uh, NRPE. Right? But we are looking forward to um, gathering additional metrics through, uh, like, uh, Solometer. And, and let me give you a slightly different way to answer that question. Um, we tried to get into the Intel presentation that was, that was uh, happening right before lunch, but we were kind of... Uh, turned away at the door because it was so full. So we went into the overflow space. And um, when the slide came up where Intel was talking about their, you know, this function was sort of down the, the left axis, you know, uh, compute, storage, monitoring, deployment, blah, 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 all those different functions that you need. We actually whipped out our iPhone to take a picture because we wanted, you know, we're, we don't, just like we said in our slide, we don't have the answer to everything and we are still in the phase of, looking to see what's out there. And you know, we're, we wouldn't be afraid, for example, to switch from A to B um, if we needed to, because we thought that was a better answer. More questions? Yeah.
So um, the question was, uh, when we went on the road shows, what were some of the uh, items that we got uh, pushed back on? Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm going to take a stab and say that um, we took a stance very early on and said that our VMs, we were going to support them, support them in a um, stateless model. Right? So you get them, and um, if they get terminated, you lost uh, you know, whatever was there. And so um, many people didn't understand that, you know, and they didn't understand how to, to build a product on a platform that behaved like that. Um, you know, and that's not to say that um, you know, OpenStack is immature. It's just that we choose to build resiliency into the application as opposed to pushing it down into the infrastructure layer. Um, so that was a, a major sticking point, right? And so we still have another sticking point of um, block storage. We do need to offer that, and we're, we're investigating our various uh, options there. I, I think those are the two main ones that we get. Correct. Um, well, like I said, uh, you know, there was some pushback on the, uh, the stateless model. I mean, it's not like we go and, at least not right now, we don't go and intentionally tear down your VMs for no good reason, right? But um, we couldn't uh, guarantee that uh, they were going to stay up through uh, maintenance. One, one cost uh, issue that pops up, well, has popped up. I can't say it's really happened more than once. Um, one of our goals is to do the DevOps thing, where we're developing the product, every product, sort of in one infrastructure, and it's going through its maturity cycle in that infrastructure, instead of um, sort of having a lab deployment versus a production deployment. And the production data center is more valuable, you know, per watt or square foot or compute cycle or whatever metric you have. It's more valuable. Uh, and so we've had a little bit of noise in the system about burning that precious resource um, on development process. That said, I think you know, we're working on the business case to show that we can actually build things faster and get it out more easily, and it's you know, less carbon intensive, as somebody else put on a slide that I loved to see today. It's less human intensive um, to do all that work. So in the long run, I think it's much more cost effective to have a unified infrastructure instead of a lab in production. But that's an example of another, of another issue that we wrestle with. Uh, so from, from my perspective as a user, uh, what we, we looked at, uh, what was being offered on OpenStack, uh, which pieces we had that would fit in no problem, and started with those. Um, as far as other things, like, you know, we're interested, we run uh, a fairly decent Cassandra workload, and that right now it's, it's not a good fit for what we have available, but we're, we're collaborating on, on, you know, what would make sense for us to be able to deploy Cassandra effectively on OpenStack. And we're working toward that both on like a hardware and software uh, perspective. So let me, I'll, I'll give you a simple answer. Um, we are users of VMware. We have a good, very substantial chunk of VMware that's sort of managed by a different part of the organization. And I think there's space for both, um, an OpenStack and a VMware world. Um, but most of what we do in our product engineering, as opposed to things that are uh, IT, CIO, back office kind of functions, uh, we look at those as scale out, and we look at OpenStack as a much better fit for scale out systems. There was a question over here. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I run a group called Product Engineering, and so we, we do engineering for video, voice, data, Wi-Fi, home security, business services, residential stuff. That's the, that's the engineering that, that we do in my team. Uh, as part of that team, we have like a, a high-end operations group, um, not the folks that, that you know, get the first tier one alarm and react to it, but it's like the people that really, you know, they're every bit an engineer as the people figuring out how to build the products. And in that group, um, you know, we had all of my other teams kind of draining into that group. There are different architectures and there are different systems and there are different ways of building things and, you know, specifying their own hardware needs and so on. 
And we said, well, that's enough of that. And we needed to create some efficiency in that part of the process. And we started looking around. Uh, and we thought that there was enough of an opportunity to improve the flow of work from the development organizations into the uh, operations engineering organization and achieve efficiency within the operations engineering organization that we could provide these things as a service. So we reallocated headcount. You know, we, we didn't go and ask for new folks, um, but we reallocated headcount because we thought it was a good strategic bet. And we've got a team of five to ten people that are pretty close to dedicated to this. And, you know, we're still, I guess the big joke at San Diego is we're hiring. So we're hiring, and uh, you know we're still looking for for more resources um, to help fill out this team. Yeah. So um, that was one of the strategies that we. Uh, oh. Um, so I'm a, right. I'll, um, so the question is essentially um, designing our applications to be resilient probably takes uh, a, a different mindset. And um, let's see if I get this right. Uh, what challenges do we have in sort of driving that to the uh, engineering folks? Is that correct? We like directness. Um, so uh, I'll take a crack at this, and I'm sure Mark will have his uh, feedback on this as well. Um, I think as a system administrator for um, some large-scale uh, projects in the past, uh, I've seen how it's done right when you scale out, and I've seen how it's done when you scale up. Um, and quite frankly, I, I believe in the scale-out model. Um, I think it works better. Uh, I think you can um, design your resiliency uh, at, a, at a higher layer, right? And, and stop trying to count on infrastructure and other teams to build in resiliency for you and, and turning to um, maybe vendors to build that resiliency for you. Yeah, I mean, um, we have a little bit of an advantage because I own both organizations. And so uh, in my staff meeting every once in a while, I, I, soft, I softly threaten the development leaders in my organization that I'm taking their capital dollars away and I'm giving all of their deployment capital dollars to the cloud team. And so if they want their application to actually launch, they, they need to figure out how to get it to run on the cloud. Now that's a bit tongue in cheek, but at some level it's, it's real. You know, I am investing disproportionately in the cloud infrastructure as opposed to the, you guys can specify it and build it and buy it yourself. In terms of getting people over the hump, where they're actually sort of naturally thinking this way, it is, you know, it's a different design methodology. And I think the best way for uh, developers to learn is by talking to each other often. And this is an example where when one development community talks to another development community, talks to another one, goes to a conference, learns about this and that, the, the comfort level and the skills and capabilities rise. Uh, so it is a lot about going to the most aggressive, you know, willing to take risk piece of the organization and saying, hey guys, would you be willing to help us pioneer this way of doing work in our development organizations at Comcast and help us prove out that this is the right model? And, you know, oftentimes they're willing to do it. They put, you know, discretionary effort into do that, doing that. Uh, and then we have a successful whatever, successful launch or a successful story to tell. And we start to pass that story around and then more people come. But to your point, it is a difficult and sort of constant process of getting people to, to move to a different yeah, could development I, could I mindset. Add, I think, because this question actually comes up a lot, and I think it's almost, um, we have this mythology around the scale-up model as being hardened, about mission critical, and, and therefore can't fail. Well, they do fail. I mean, failure is a part of this, and I think more than anything else, when we're thinking about putting resiliency in the application, we're recognizing that failure does happen, and that really the application is probably a better place to actually handle that and move to, like you said, stateless systems. The other thing that we're using to our advantage here is that we're saying some of the hard stuff about building 
resilient, scalable things such as storage systems and where you do have to do, is we're, we're putting that into services. So that's where you see Swift, you see other, other kind of technologies being developed, Cassandra and others, which means the expertise in building these scalable, resilient systems can be encapsulated and then provided to the application developer so he doesn't have to worry about that. So there is, there is a, a mindset change about building scalable, horizontally scalable applications, but also then as much as possible encapsulating the hard parts into these services. And so that's why we're looking for it. So where is the next, you know, be in terms of like key value stores and NoSQL databases so that the hard part can go and we can have the expertise and the accumulated experience that all the applications can then benefit from. And I think one of the things we're doing too is when we talk to a lot of these development organizations, we're, we're having them start off with a hybrid model. So they don't necessarily have to move an entire application stack over to the cloud, but maybe their web tier or app tier is a good fit and until they catch up and get their database problems re-architected and whatnot to, to work in cloud, hey, start here, get exposed to it, and get them thinking in that cloud mentality. And we try to coach them through that. And, and within my organization, um, the, the vast majority of our apps now are uh, scale out. And when ones have single points of failure, that's like a big red flag. And we're really encouraging saying, you know, when are you ready for you know, our equivalent of, of Chaos Monkey to be applied and so people are really aware when they're developing if they if they haven't solved that like you know single special snowflake problem yet that that, that really needs to be high on their priority list one more comment just because i've heard it actually in a couple of other sessions as well there's another real benefit which you can directly attribute to a, a cost savings which is that when you have to update things when you have to replace things if you've already built resiliency into your application, you can take those systems down and update them and replace them. And you can do that multiple times a day, tens of times a day, hundreds of times a day. You can update the applications because they are designed to, to continue to run even though components of those things are being taken offline. That's a tremendous cost saving when you, when you know that both in the time and the management and process and everything else that you have to go through to update things, you can, you can directly, you know, you had enormous cost savings if you just build this kind of continuous deployment into your model right from the start. We did that on all new hardware. Um, we started off small, and then as demand has grown, we've added hardware. Um, we still have a lot of... Uh, uh, older applications or legacy applications that we point to existing infrastructure, so we've been building it on new hardware. Yes, so we definitely are interested in the elasticity of applications. Um, I think we have a lot of various events and things that we support, um, and that's actually one of the reasons we're not just interested and how OpenStack works today, but we have a lot of interest in metal as a service because some of those applications we want to scale um, actually do require bare metal. Um, and we might want to switch, like one day be doing a Hadoop type thing and another day be doing um, a different application. So here's a, here's a real world example. We didn't do this yet, but um, this is the kind of thing that we think about for that question. Um, every single keystroke that we type on, on this mm -hmm. service goes through our it's called the XRE, the cross-platform rendering, rendering engine, engine um, which is one of the things that's running on top of OpenStack. And so if you man imagine Super Bowl Sunday, when halftime starts, how many keystrokes happen on however many remote controls are out there in the world in Comcast footprint? It's a large number. I don't know what it is, but we all can perhaps say it's a large number. And it is probably disproportionately timed at that moment to be a flash crowd or in that 10 second window or 30 second window. We're gonna get a lot of traffic. So we, we actually plan and did this year because this has been rolling out for a little while now. We planned this year to take special action to make sure that we were ready to handle unique events like Super Bowl Sunday because it's one of the most watched television events. A couple of weeks ago, we did an event called Watchathon Week, where we made things like HBO 
uh, and other premium channels available to our customers for free for a period of time. And it was tremendously successful, and now we have more data than we know what to do with about what customers watched and how they navigated and how they found the content and all this other good stuff. And so during the period where we're delivering the content on, uh, for Watchathon Week, wouldn't it be nice, as I said, we did not do this yet, but wouldn't it be nice if we could you know, reshuffle the cards, so to speak, and get a little more delivery capacity for that service? And then after Watchathon Week, reshuffle the cards, bring down that delivery capacity, and bring up the capacity to analyze all that interesting data. And then maybe two years from now, or two more Watchathon Weeks from now, wouldn't it be neat if we had the ability to actually do that analysis in real time and to fine tune Watchathon Week for each individual customer so that when we figure out what you're interested in in Watchathon Week, if you want to try out Games of Thrones because you're not an HBO subscriber and you want to try it out now, um, that we make it, we, we figure that out and we do special stuff for you because you're trying to sample Game of Thrones. Yeah, that's actually another um, good good challenge and good good barrier. So the question was, do we have organizational support for the capital expenditure in advance? Um, the to, to answer your question for the company overall, I think the answer is we're going to do what's right for our business. When you get down to the detail and figure out if I could actually write a purchase order and everybody who has to you know sign that purchase order is happy about doing it, um, the answer is a little less rosy. So. We have not historically had the philosophy that it's okay to pre-buy data center space, it's okay to pre-buy compute and storage stuff. Because this is a relatively um, uh, you know, up and coming approach and the company is so focused on innovation and so focused on um, you know, analysis of information to bring better value to customers, uh, that attitude I think is changing because what we've done in the technology organization is connect the um, value to the business to the capital expenditure. So we say that if you guys want us to innovate more quickly and if you want us to build this stuff faster and if you want us to operate our platform with fewer people, all of those are good economic things because you know some of them drive revenue and some of them lower cost, then we need flexibility in other ways to be able to do that. And one thing that we need is advanced data center space, advanced networking capacity, and advanced um, uh, storage and compute capacity. So the attitude is changing, but you know, if you walked around the hallway, I, you know, I don't think you'd get universally supportive responses from from our from our team. Sure. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that when we started this that we offered Swift um, as a service. Um, the, the usage of that isn't quite as high as we'd like right now. Um, there's, uh, there's been a slow adoption to Swift at the moment, um, but we're still pushing people to, to really use object storage as opposed to stop writing things on the file system when they really don't need to be there. And then the second question was about the CDN. And just to clarify the question, did you want to know, you asked if we used the CDN to deliver what? Uh, OK, to, to deliver the television. Uh, today we, we, materially speaking, do not use our CDN to deliver live broadcast television. We do use several flavors of CDN to deliver on-demand experiences. So we actually have a thing that we call a CDN that most of you know, our internet colleagues would not necessarily recognize as a Akamai-like CDN um, to deliver on-demand to a, to a set-top box. We use something that looks a lot more like a, a CDN to deliver things, um, uh, uh, to deliver IP experiences. So whether it's to the Xbox, so those of you who aren't Comcast customers, you may not know maybe some of you who are may not know, that you can get our on-demand experience on your Xbox. Um, and so we deliver 
our on-demand library to your Xbox. It's the same service that you see here on the set-top box, but we use a much more internet-like CDN. It leverages IP technology um, uh, to deliver that experience to the set-top box, or to the Xbox. Yeah. Um, to, to, for delivering this, no. The, this is a this is a Title VI service. It's called. It's a regulated service, and there are um, requirements that we have to meet. Uh, for example, we have to provide emergency alert uh, service over over this product, um, and we also need to deliver the service from our owned and operated infrastructure. So there is no option for this particular service for us to look at uh, at an outside party. More questions. We'll probably two, three. When are we? When do we wrap? There's about another. We've got another couple of minutes. So probably one more question or must two. Yes. You want to do it? Or you want yeah. To? So I mean, I think we're still in the early stages there. Um, uh, we try to anticipate our customers' needs via a lot of conversations and, and, and surveying, um, as well as looking at our usage and metrics. We are pulling reports out of, we're running SX right now, so we're, we've built kind of our own reports coming out of that. We're very interested in rolling out uh, Solometer and getting more data to predict where we're going. But right now, we're also still kind of hedging our bets based on where we think we're going to need things today. I think we're probably out of time, and I want to make sure you've got opportunity to get to the next session. So thank you all very much for attending. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you.